Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Safety and Health webcast, NFPA 70E, Are You Compliant or Safe?, sponsored by Bulwark. My name is Barry Botino. I am an associate editor with Safety and Health magazine, and I will be moderating today's session. Thanks for joining us. In a few minutes, we'll start the presentation, but first I'd like to go over some preliminary items. The views of today's speaker and organization are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the council or the magazine endorses those items. At the end of today's webcast, we will conduct a question and answer session. To ask a question today, simply type it in the text box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen and click the button for Submit Question. Feel free to ask your question at any time during the presentation. You don't have to wait for the question and answer session to begin. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible today, because of, but because of the large number of participants, we might not get to every question. Any unanswered questions will be forwarded to today's speaker. For basic troubleshooting information, click the Help button located on your screen. At the end of the webcast, you'll be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey. I will let you know more about that after the presentation. This webcast is archived, so you can access it after today's live event. To view this webcast and all of our past webcasts, just go to safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events. With that, let's get started. Our speaker today is Derek Sang. Derek is a technical training manager at Bulwark and a subject matter expert in the flame-resistant clothing industry. He has developed more than 40 hours of training curriculum and conducted more than 250 seminars on the hazards of arc flash and flash fire. Again, we thank all of you for tuning in to this presentation. Derek, whenever you're ready, take it away. Barry, thank you for that kind introduction. Greatly appreciated, and I'd like to echo uh, good morning and or good afternoon wherever you're choosing to listen to us today. It's greatly appreciated taking time out of your valuable day to do this live. So as Barry said, let's get started. Let's get the attorneys out of the way. This presentation is for informational purposes only. Customers of Bulwark Protective Brands are solely responsible for conducting their own hazard risk assessments to identify safety hazards in their work environment. Customers of Bulwark Protective Brands are solely responsible for selecting appropriate garments and protective gear for their employees and ensuring wearers use the garments and protective gear properly and in conjunction with the appropriate gloves and footwear. Because working conditions and other factors may vary, Bulwark Protective Apparel does not make any representations that these garments and protective gear will protect wearers from injury. Thankfully, I'm not out of breath after that. So into the good stuff. Why are you tuned in today? We're going to have some insight specifically into NFPA 70E. The latest edition is 2018. And all going well, if we've done a good job here in 45 minutes, you'll get a feel for being compliant to the standard, and really how do you apply it to be, to be safe? That's the goal. We're not going to be able to get to everything here in about 45 or 50 minutes, but we're going to do our best, and hopefully you'll have some gold nuggets to take away. We always get answered, well, excuse me, we always get asked, who's responsible? What does the law say? For most on the line here today, this is going to be review. But obviously, the employer general duty clause states, in a nutshell, paraphrasing, you will not hurt, maim, or kill me, your employee on the job. That's the overarching principle of that uh, general GDC. We also have, in the law, we have our own kind of PPE regula regulation, 1910-132. And specifically, when you're looking at choosing flame-resistant and arc-rated clothing, what's OSHA require you to do? Select and have each affected employee use, demonstrate they know how to use, make sure it matches the hazard or hazards. For additional guidance in doing this, look to industry consensus standards. What are those standards? We're talking about one of them here today, 70E. You also have 2112, 2113, 1891 on the ASTM side for rain gear in ARC, ASTM 2733 for rain gear and flash fire. So there's a lot of good standards and for you to assist you in being compliant to the law. 
So why should we be concerned with electrical safety? I got told a long time ago, when I first got started in this, by an electrical safety guy, Derek, we are very, very good with electricity. We are highly trained when it comes to electricity. Unfortunately, when mistakes are making with electricity, there's very few little electrical accidents. They tend to be big and they tend to be catastrophic, both in injury and, and uh, in, some, in many cases, lives. The numbers, you all know the numbers if you work in and around electricity, large number of disabling electrical contact injuries, 180 fatalities just from electrocution alone, anywhere up to 2,000 electrical workers sent to burn units uh, each year from arc flash hazards, and you know the numbers yourself, 10 times more likely to be fatal than general industry. So it's a high risk environment. In fact, it's represented when you even look at the citations. Pick a year. This year happens to be 30% of all citations, three of the top 10 citations are electrical. Just that last year it dropped down to two, so 20% of the top 10 were in and around electrical. So we were trained, we know what we're doing, we're still not doing as best as we possibly uh, could be, and we all know when it comes to citations, that's the tip of the iceberg. So when we look at the cost of this, what do we see? Well, you can see facilities that adopt uh, following elect good electrical safe work practices. They invest in, in electrical training. They do their electrical assessments. They have the appropriate electrical PPD, PPE. They update things as possible. And then you have other sites. In this example here, you have one site. You have two sites, similar dynamics, similar in size. The assumption here is similar in equipment. Okay, we can we can pick the example apart. But what the key part to note is, they had an electrical accident in one facility that cost them roughly. $5.8 million when it was all said and done. The other site that put together a good sound electrical safe work program, they went the same amount of time with a total cost of about $87,000 or roughly $17,000 a year. The example is this, do you want to not do anything and hope things go well? Or do you want to invest a little on the front end, minimizing if something does go wrong on the back end? So the dollars and cents make sense. Investing in safety makes sense. We all understand and appreciate that. So what is the real danger when we're talking specifically about arc flash? And we'll get into the 70E, the compliance portion of it here shortly. The real danger in arc flashes is not arcs. In fact, I am not aware of a single case where arc flash in and of itself causes fatality. What ultimately causes fatalities when it comes to arc flash is what? Clothing ignition. Why clothing ignition? Clothing ignition, one, extends the event. Arc flashes, six cycle closing time is a long arc. Six cycles is one fifth of a second. Uh, when you look at the duration, yes, the intensity is high, duration is relatively low. Without clothing ignition, the event does not continue on. By continuing on, you now get into catastrophic body burn. Catastrophic body burn is ultimately what leads electrical workers to becoming statistics. What you see in this picture demonstrates that. On the left, you see the arc. The arc is focusing on the front, the front half of that mannequin wearing fabric, wearing garments in front of that arc. Unfortunately, in the second picture, those are not arc-rated garments. That thermal energy you see engulfing the back of the garment that was not in the original arc flash, that thermal energy is clothing ignition. All that energy starting to encase that mannequin is the clothing he was wearing catching fire and continuing to burn. For cotton garments, you're burning at 400 degrees. 
that's heavy, it's going to be hot, and it's going to burn for a long time. That's a lot of fuel. 6535 is going to burn off, melt off, but that's still a lot of heat for an extended period of time. Three to four seconds with 400 to 500 degrees temperature is going to result in third degree burns. What other things happen in arc flashes? Remember, we are just looking at, from a PPE standpoint, we are just looking at not igniting and continuing to burn. We are looking, by definition, self-extinguishing. No melt, no drip, don't add to the injury. But when you superheat air, and you all know the numbers, 35,000 degrees in the arc gap, 8 to 10,000 degrees, 12 inches outside that box, when you superheat air that rapidly, you get a lot of other nasty things happening. It's virtually a bomb going off in front of that electrical worker 18 inches away from them. You get Obviously, the blinding white light, if you're not wearing your arc-rated face shield, if you're not wearing your safety glasses, you can have temporary blindness. You're going to see burns from that heat on anything that is exposed. You're going to have a concussive force, 2,200 square foot pounds, that's going to cause injuries. You're going to see, uh, excuse me, here, noise. When you set off a bomb that close to you, you get about 165 decibels in an eight calorie arc flash. To give you some perspective, a 737 leaving a tarmac is about 135. So what do we have here? Temporary blindness, temporarily deafness, and your clothing catches fire. Stop, drop, and roll gonna help you here. No, okay, if you have clothing ignition under these conditions, very highly unlikely you're going to be able to put yourself out. That's why we see such evasive injuries. So what industries do, are we talking about? Really, anything that has walls and anything that has gray boxes attached to the walls somewhere in that building. Think of all your manufacturing facilities, food processing facilities, medical facilities. Heck, in medical facilities, you're running engineers, electricians, 24-7, 365. Uh, you can make the same argument in some of our casinos uh, that never shut down. Uh, universities, universities with medical centers. Think of all the electrical workers needed to keep those small cities uh, online, lit up, research facilities. So 70E is applicable all over general industry. In fact, the numbers are high as uh, three to five percent of all folks are in and around electrical equipment, keeping it up and running and maintained. As I mentioned earlier, the general industry PPE clause or OSHA 1910-132. Uh, uh, what does it say about protective equipment? Protective equipment includes protective clothing, along with your eye protection, your head protection, your respiratory devices, etc. So once you do your hazard assessment and your folks can be exposed to accidental thermal exposure, which could potentially uh, cause clothing to ignite, that clothing must have flame-resistant arc-rated properties. So real quick, flame-resistant and arc-rated, what does that mean? All arc-rated clothing is flame-resistant. It has to start out and meet the requirements for flame resistancy. self extinguishes will not melt, drip, or add to the industry. And then it goes through additional testing in order to have an arc rating. Arc rating is achieved by actually exposing it to a controlled arc flash hazard. So once your clothing has an ATPV or an E sub BT, it has an arc rating. So that is the appropriate clothing to be wearing in and around this hazard. How do you know that? OSHA doesn't tell you to go out necessarily and get arc-rated clothing. It just says generally protect your people. Do a hazard assessment and protect your folks. That's where your standards come into play. Your standards are your playbook on how to comply to the law. So you have, in this case, NFPA 70E, what we're talking about. ASTM 1506 is inside NFPA 70E as the recommended uh, standard to follow for clothing that is used in and around 
Spark Flash. You'll also see uh, some ANSI requirements when it comes into HiViz. You'll see ANSI and ASTM paired together and NFPA 70 when you're looking at HiViz and ARC rated or flame resistant garments. So they, there's a lot of crossover within our standards to help give us guidance to protect our folks. If you haven't seen the latest and greatest, it's the big yellow one with our uh, safety triangle there. That's the latest edition, that's 2018. The priority for NFPA 70E continues to be work de-energized and also to have an arc flask risk assessment done. Review that every five years or if you have major changes, but that is the main goal for 70E. 70E was primarily written to prevent this. In 2000, when it came out and made the first mention of FR clothing at the time, it was written to get electricians out of cotton. Cotton is not a safety upgrade for electrical workers. Cotton is latent fuel. In my world, in the FR world, that's what we refer to as cotton garments. Those garments are made of fuel. Apply enough energy, and it is not a lot of energy. It's about 400 to 500 degrees, and you will have cotton ignition. The problem is that once cotton ignites, it does not put itself out. Non-FR cotton will continue to burn until that fuel source is put out, or you interrupt it, either using some kind of suppression system or using your hands, using a blanket, you're going to have to interrupt that cycle. We do not want electrical workers in cotton. The other reason that we uh, 70E was written, in my opinion, is to tell electricians this. How big a bomb they're standing in front of so that they can dress accordingly. 70E for the Decades now has emphasized doing your hazard risk assessment and getting labels on your equipment so electrical workers, when they approach that gear, whatever it is, have a communication that tells them if everything fails, what is the expectation coming out of that equipment? Is it four calories of incident energy? or is it 20 calories of incident energy? Those are completely different scenarios, completely different PPE, and you do not know what that is by looking just at the gray box. There's lots of evidence when we talk to folks who actually go on site and do these engineering studies, they'll tell you a 480 panel, 480 panel side by side, one of them's cat one, which is less than four calories of incident energy, and the other one is CAT4, which is up to 40 calories of incident energy. I would sure like to know which one I'm standing in front of. So how are you choosing your arc flash PPE at, at your site? And if you're a contractor, what are you talking to your hosts about as far as it comes to their PPE? What should my guys be wearing on your site? How are you communicating what they need to be? So your incident energy analysis method, that's where we come up with an actual incident energy. On that label, it will tell you this is 3.7 calories of incident energy if it fails. The category method, which you may or may not be more familiar with, that's your CAT 1, 2, 3, and 4. But regardless of which one the facility is using, there's a couple of things that you want to note on those. Uh, in 2015, excuse me, in 2018, we changed from 2015. 2015, we had the yes, no table. If your equipment is this, do you need PPE? Yes, then you went over to the task base table and you made your corresponding one, two, three, or four decision. They've defaulted back to the more traditional system prior to 2015 where you're going to go through the task. What is the task I'm doing? I look for it in 70E, I go down the table. I'm voltage testing on a 480 panel fed by this. Do I need PPE? Yes. Well, what PPE? That one's probably going to be, let's say it's CAT2 or it's CAT3, CAT4. That's how the tables have been done. It's a more, the more traditional task uh, table method uh, replaced the yes and no tables from, from 2015. So that was a change in 2018. 
There's your traditional look, your PPE category. Remember, it's no longer your hazard risk category. It's the PPE category. Uh, the marketplace has simplified that to CAT, CAT 1, 2, 3, and 4. Uh, we used to have HRC. The nomenclature is still around, but the common term, hazard risk category, PPE category, was CAT. So the industry has kind of adopted a CAT 1, CAT 2, CAT 3, CAT 4 abbreviation. So that's what your categories of protection are. That is the maximum amount of incident energy that that PPE category can, can be used in. Uh, so, for example, CAT 1, you're looking at you have to have 4.1 calories of protection or higher to be in a CAT 1 piece of equipment. Same for CAT 2, you have to have 8.1 or higher for CAT 2, CAT 3, 25.1 and higher to protect against CAT 3. Then CAT 4, that's your 40 cal uh, limitation there in the tables. The important thing to note, though, is when you're doing your incident energy analysis on the arc flash versus PPE category, what are your pros and what are your cons? The PPE category approach really simplifies things. One, two, three, or four. Most sites default to two and four. Why? Daily wear is CAT 2, so eight calories or higher for all my shirts, pants, and coveralls. And if I need to go into anything bigger than that, I've got a CAT 4 flash suit sitting in my locker or in my hot kit that I'm going to utilize. That also parallels with the simplified two-step approach in Annex H. The incident energy method allows me a tad bit more flexibility. For example, in the CAT method, if I had a 10-calorie piece of equipment, I'm looking at this piece of equipment. It says on there its incident energy is 10 calories. That means what? I only have to wear 10.1 calories of protection to work on a 10-cal piece of equipment. If I'm using the CAT method, what does that default to? It's not CAT 2 because it's above age, so that means I have to wear what? CAT 3. Go back to the table. What does CAT 3C say? 25 calorie flash suit. So if you do have and done your study, you're going to know what is the biggest piece of equipment and exposure that I have. If everything is within this range, or if I have 90% of my equipment within this range, it helps you really dial in what your PPE can be. If you want to use the broader general, more conservative, working on the tables, you can do that with the CAT method. You also have to understand what the limitations are. There's limitations when it comes to what the maximum available fault current are, clearing times, and working distance. If they are within these three points, you can't use the CAT system. So that's one caveat there. You have to do your... Uh, incident energy analysis and know what those are. The bottom line at the end of the day is you want to be wearing more arc rated protection than the incident energy predicted to come out of that piece of equipment. Whether you're following the CAT method or the incident energy method, have more than what's coming out. And that can be as simple as just a tad more or in the conservative use of the table, sometimes it can be a lot more but having more is the key when it comes to protection against uh, the incident energy that you're exposed to. Do you always need the PPE? And by PPE here, we're talking about primarily arc-rated clothing. Uh, the answer is no, not all the time. And then it gives you a list that you have to be able to answer in order to not be wearing arc-rated clothing. Every electrician I've talked to, this is very, very difficult. In fact, most of them say you can't obtain all six of these in order to remove the arc-rated clothing. The simple thing is today, you should be wearing at least an arc-rated shirt pant or an arc-rated coverall as a baseline of protection all day, every day, because by definition, these are accidental, and I definitely want to have some protection as a baseline regardless as I'm working in and around energized equipment doing energized tasks by 70E standards. As you're all aware, the tasks that you're allowed to do is voltage testing, troubleshooting, and verifying. 
everything else after that, that's your diagnostics piece, your maintenance piece after that, they're looking and wanting you to de-energize. If not, go through an extensive justification and do your energized work permit in order to justify doing uh, that energized work. Training. Training is a big part in and around this. This is now PPE. We are required to train our employees on all the PPE that they're implementing in the field. The biggest thing that we have, the biggest challenge that we have, and I've kind of alluded to it in the previous slides, is having people understand we live in a secondary protective clothing arena. So if you have secondary, what's primary? Easiest analogy for people to get their heads around is firefighters. Big red truck, flashing red lights, structural fire. I roll up on site. I probably already donned the lower half of my bunker gear, which includes my specialized footwear. I have the upper half of my bunker gear, and I'm fastening the closures as I'm getting off the truck. I have my really cool hard hat, my special gloves. The most important piece I need next to all that PPE for an extended exposure inside a burning building is my breathing apparatus. I grab my pole axe and I voluntarily walk into a burning building. How am I able to do that? Two things. One, it's in the job title, firefighter. Secondly, do I trust my PPE for a long-term thermal exposure? Yes, that's what it's been tested to, that's what it's been proven to, and I know it works. When I put that fire out and I get back to the station house, do I need to be wearing all that PPE? No. Why not? It's task-based. We are knowingly going into a thermal event. We dress accordingly. In our world, when do we have to be wearing it? The answer that should be resonating inside your heads is all the time. Why? We don't build electrical equipment to blow up. We are not knowingly standing in front of a piece of equipment that's going to fail and have an arc flash. These are accidental. The only way to ensure that I have a baseline of protection is to have my arc rated shirt, pan, and coverall on me at all times, especially when my job description is electrician. I am going to be voltage testing, troubleshooting, and verifying something numerous times throughout my workday. So let's back off and make it a task-based program. Okay, I have a hot kit. Inside that hot kit, I have a 12-calorie coverall, my hard hate face shields, rubbers, leathers, my balaclava, my insulated tools, my hearing protection, eye protection. And I'm going to carry that with me, and throughout my workday, I am going to don my PPE every time I do an energized task, voltage test, troubleshoot, or verify. Let's say I do 10 tasks a day. Let's say I have 10 colleagues within my facility that do 10 tasks a day. For that single facility, that's 100 energized tasks a day that you're going to trust me to get in and out of my arc-rated clothing every single time to troubleshoot and uh, voltage test and verify, things that I do all the time. Do you think there's a chance in any given day and any given year that I may not do that? Because why? There's 35,000 opportunities within that scenario for me not to get into my arc-rated clothing. Where if I was wearing it all the time, I would have that on, and then I would be adding my hard hat, my face shield, my rubbers, my leathers, my balaclava, safety glasses, hearing protection for, for the tasks that I'm doing. Again, we can be compliant. That hot kit is compliant. Safe. Yes, if you implement it every single time. So remember, PPE is what? It is the least effective, and it is the last layer of our hierarchy of controls. We would love to eliminate energized equipment, substitute for energized equipment, put engineering controls on energized equipment, have tons of admins from any energized work. But your last line of defense, your safety belt, is your PPE. And as we're talking about, just like a safety belt, it only works well when? When you're wearing it. 
it does you no good to click it just before the accident. And if you click it behind you or if it's sitting in your truck or sitting in your locker, it's not going to protect you. So let's look at some do's and don'ts. When we're training on folks on what to do and what not to do, we always get, well, how do you wear this stuff? This is what properly implemented arc rated shirt and pant looks like. It is buttoned up, it is tucked in, and the sleeves are rolled down and buttoned. What do we see in the field when we're out and about? Unfortunately, we see lots of this and variations of this. I am unbuttoned. I'm exposing my 100% cotton. Let's hope that's what it is, and it's not 80-20, and it's not 50-50, but that's our 100% cotton t-shirt. Our sleeves are rolled up. We're untucked, so when that arc hits the ground, that thermal energy rises, blouses our untucked shirt, and then that energy goes up underneath, touching that 3.5, 4.5 ounce, remember what's cotton, latent fuel. We even have a term for it. It's called the chimney effect. That's you burning inside your arc rated clothing. Sleeves rolled up. Rubbers and leathers do not extend always all the way to the top. Remember what we said at 10,000 degrees of energy coming out? It's going to burn any exposed skin. Are your arms a lot closer than 18 inches? Yes, they are. How much incident energy are they exposed to? Food for thought. Again, being compliant versus being safe. Things to think about. Do you work in inclement weather? Do you have this perfectly good arc rated, very expensive arc rated jacket? That hoodie there becomes what? The outermost layer. Is that arc rated? Is it arc rated to the hazard? Things to think about. You could be jeopardizing your very good arc rated clothing program by not coaching your folks up what they need to have on underneath. Another area that we see where just people get caught a little bit off guard is what are we wearing on our heads? What are we wearing under hard hats? When it's cold outside, as it is these days, what's that beanie, watch cap uh, made out of? What about that bandana? What about that head wrap, that head sock? What about this ball cap? Does it have at least flame-resistant properties where it will self-extinguish, not melt, drip, and add to the injury? You do not want melting anything in and around your head. Your brain is very susceptible to heat. Slight increases in heat over slight times can cause swelling in the brain, which can lead to uh, significant uh, injuries. So as we're training on all these things, the other thing we can look at is what can we do underneath our flame-resistant arc-rated clothing. We're seeing a big push today for arc-rated flame-resistant base layers. Why? Two lightweight layers can be more protective than one single heavy layer. If you want a, a lightweight solution, you can get there with two lightweight layers and exceed what the heaviest outer layer, single layer, is going to provide you. If you want to do that, get it tested. You'll be able to know what your system is from the waist up, and you can start implementing that. The other big thing is, is it eliminates the need for the underwear police. Who are those guys? That's the guy who's going to go around and verify that every electrician on your staff, when they're wearing a white T-shirt, that it's 100% cotton. It's not 80-20 not 50-50, it's not 60-40, and it's absolutely, let's make sure that undergarment's not a multiple synthetic like high-performance synthetic uh, stuff we see in exercise, uh, stuff we see in the gyms today. Uh, we all know what the, the popular brand names are. So we're seeing a big push when it comes into those. As we said, look at training. When it comes to 70E, every three years or job duties change. Uh, we want to see uh, training in and around uh, your PPE. Here's what 1910-132 tells you. When PPE is necessary, what PPE is necessary? In this case, how to don and doff it. That's our fancy way of saying put it on, taking it off. Do we have to have considerations? Do we have anti-static concerns? Do we have to move into separate changing rooms anytime we're, we're moving in and out of our PPE? 
Uh, do we a lot? Do we take our PPE home and wear it to the job site, or do we have locker rooms? All those things need to be addressed. The big one, and we'll talk about it shortly, is care and maintenance. Do we? Yes, we need to train our people on how to care for their flame-resistant arc-rated clothing. Then our employees have to acknowledge that they understand it, demonstrate that they understand it, and obviously we record it for training purposes. So where can we look to verify and protection? The easiest place to start looking is looking at your labels. If you have implemented flame-resistant arc-rated clothing, if you have it on your job site today, you know we have lots of labels on that gear. Why? We're required to communicate a lot of information on your gear. In fact, the standards tell us we need to be able to provide tracking numbers, identif identification codes. Why? Not when everything's going good, but if that shirt, pant, coverall is ever in an incident, we have to provide the tracking mechanism to get back to what was the test data on that, what role did it come from, when was it this, when was it that, and provide all that information to you. So all those are in there. That's where your ARC rating, your ATPV or your E sub BT is, is communicated to you. So you can make that match. If you know your incident energy on 80% of your equipment is seven calories or less, you want to have more than seven calories protection in that ATPV or E sub BT, and that's where the communication is, is done for you. So you have an ARC flash hazard, uh, now what? You've estimated your, uh, your incident energies, you communicated those, those incident energies, uh, you have an arc rating of eight calories a centimeter or more. Would you need to change anything if you currently have a CAT 2 requirement? In this case, no. If you do have some more equipment that's higher than CAT 2, what can you do? Well, depending on what it is, you can get some distance, Okay, get away further away than 18 inches, recalibrate to what that is, and do your work remotely, uh, apply chicken switches, get on the end of a hot stick, implement some distance that way. The other thing you can do is look at layering up. Remember I said you can get more protective in two lightweight layers than you necessarily can in one single heavyweight layer. As we talked about, why are two arc-rated layers important? Because arc energies are, one, they can be un unpredictable. They're not necessarily what the calculation says. Uh, secondly, that outer layer can fail. If you're a little bit closer or that equipment stays open a little bit longer or closed a little bit longer, you can have that outer layer start to fail. That's what we call break open. That's a sample of break open at the top. Now what you have underneath is extremely important on how you will come out of that. The lower picture, remember that brand of athletic performance where I talked about? Unfortunately, this young electrician will carry those scars forever. Uh, he made a mistake. His outer layer, his outer arc rated layer worked perfectly. That radiant heat, all that energy passed through the fabric and hit plastic. And remember, what did I say about 2,200 square foot pounds of concussive force? That drove that plastic into his skin. He spent 30 days in a burn unit getting plastic deburred out of him because he made a mistake on what he wore underneath. As you're looking to layer to, make, uh, to meet the hazard, uh, the only way you can determine what the total system arc rating is is make sure that it's being tested how it's going to be implemented. Whatever the weight of the fabric is on the outside, whatever the weight of the fabric is on inside, that's how it's going to be tested in a layer testing uh, apparatus. Our standards for this have recognized that in many cases it makes sense to layer up because in many cases you'll be dealing with equipment that is going to be significant in its incident energy. In 1506, in the non-mandatory informational section, uh, section 11, it walks you through and recognizing that layering can be an appropriate application to dealing with some of these higher energies. So which arc rated base layer is going to be correct for you? We have long sleeve base layers and we also have short sleeve base layers. Which one's correct for you? Well, if you just want the benefit 
of the additional protection where you're going, well, two layers of uh, FR arc rated fabric is better than one layer, then you can have the short sleeve. If you're looking to implement a system approach to where you want to get the benefit of the cumulative effect of the base layer, the air gap, and the outer layer, then short sleeves are no. Why? Because you're unprotected basically from the elbow to the wrist. That makes that area single layer. You can only claim what the outermost layer's protection is. So from a system standpoint, you can have increase from a general protection standpoint, you can wear short sleeve and just know that you're not wearing anything ignitable underneath or meltable underneath. You've eliminated that. So where do you get this information on how much protection is supplied when these two layers are implemented? Top manufacturers have all done a lot of homework for you. Obviously, there's a ton of different uh, scenarios with a ton of different layers. But in this case, myself, my colleagues who are in the marketplace have done a lot of work. Here you have uh, the Bulwark Arc Calculator. You can find that on our website. But just real quick, Crip, there's a standard base layer. It has an ATPV of 6.4 calories. What is that? That's Cat 1. Here we have an outer layer that is 6.3 calories. That, too, is Cat 1. Well, if I'm in a Cat 2 facility, I can't wear that, even though it's lighter and potentially more comfortable than my Cat 2 garment. But if I implement the two together, the combined effect of that layered system is well above their sum. Their sum would be what? 12.7. What's their actual? 24. That's 24 calories protection I now have on the, from the waist up. Remember that uh, 10 calorie piece of gear that I said we would be working on? And if I used the CAT system, I'd have to climb into a 25 calorie suit. I've now got 24 calories of protection from the waist up. So what do I have to do now in order to work on that 10? I just have to ensure that my lower half is more than 10. So here we have pants that have an ATP of 12. If I combine that with my 24, what's my system? The lowest number. What's my system here? It's a 12. Can I work on the 10? Yes. Now, obviously, I've taken out the, the hard hat, the face shield, the balaclava. I've taken those elements out because I'm talking just about the clothing standpoint. We still have to match our face shield. And we still have to match those things. But from a clothing standpoint, those two lightweight layers and that 12-calorie pant sure beats the heck out of climbing into a 25-cal flash suit. So we always have to be aware that we still have great building it from the waist up because that's where the layer it is. What are we from the waist down? That's typically going to be your lowest number. That's what your system is going to be. Care and maintenance. Again, we want to read the labels. Our labels here some of the other labels and the other information on those labels is we tell you how to take care of this stuff. This is where we tell you tumble dry, no bleach, no starch, no fabric softener. What do the standards tell you? Follow the manufacturer's guidelines. Ours can be found on our website. My counterparts on their website, you can easily download PDFs for how to care and maintain this stuff. Looking in today's market, looking at quality fabrics, quality manufacturers, it is very, very hard to mess up flame-resistant arc-rated clothing today. If you do a few things correctly, it's going to last you a long time, and it's going to be able to do what it's designed for, and that's protect you in an accidental thermal event, whether that's an arc flash or a flash fire. Uh, we provide laundry mag magnets for you to do at home. Obviously, if you want to simplify things and have an industrial laundry, if you have additional hazards that you, you don't want to take home, industrial laundries, if you want to have one process for cleaning, drying, repairing, etc., industrial laundries are also a great, a great avenue. But real simple, don't use bleach or peroxide. Why? Weaken the fibers. They're weakening your protection. Don't put any additives on there. Don't put any starches. Don't put anything in there. They can mask the performance over time. 
Wash them separately. Why? One, those are your work clothes. You're bringing nasty stuff home potentially from work. And secondly, you don't want to wash non-FR with FR. Turn them inside out, color retention. Now you're getting into best practices. There's nothing here where you're reading this in the standards. You're doing things like tumble dry, don't overheat. You're doing some common sense things for the longevity of the garment, so it's going to give you the best wear life over time. We always get asked about soiled garments. Stained garments in and of themselves do not represent a compromise in the flame-resistant properties. What a compromise in the flame-resistant properties would be if those stains are caused by secondary accelerants and they still smell like what? Secondary accelerants. If you smell like fuel, you are what? Fuel. That fuel is going to be used in a thermal event. Now, the picture on the top, if that's during the workday and that's secondary accelerant, get me out of harm's way. Either I don't work in and around anything energized or I get back and I change. That is too much. On the lower half, you're making a business decision here. Can I work in and around energized equipment with this small spattering of Fuel. Those are going to be what's called hot spots. The FR fabric is significant enough in and around it. It will do its jobs, and you'll have little flares up while that fuel is consumed. Uh, just know that that's happening and understand that that can happen in a thermal event. Fuel is fuel. Repairing or replacing garments. There are some common sense things to think about. There's some rule of thumbs. There's nothing really uh, the standards tell you to keep repairs to a minimum, then don't tell you what minimum is. Our rule of thumb is size of a nickel for a hole, three inches for a rip. On your upper left here, those are thread barn. That is an elbow starting to wear through. That's the secondary fibers that you're seeing there that cannot be repaired. The one in the middle, we have a rip that is well over three inches on multiple sides cannot be repaired. Now, lower left, you see a rip on the seam that's more than three inches. Could it be repaired? <clears throat> Technically, it's on the seam. I could get some Aramid Nomex thread and I could make that repair. It's over three inches though. Wouldn't recommend it. On the shoulder here, we're looking in and around three inches. Yeah, could you make that repair? Sure. Get on the Google box, key in Aramid thread, go online, buy yourself light-colored Nomex thread because, and keep some of those old shirts around and cut them up to make patches. Like materials and FR thread is what you make repairs with. Inspect garments daily. Check for holes, rips, and tears. Check areas for heavy wear such as elbows, knees, thighs. Uh, check the integrity of your seams. Bottom line is you have to create the mindset as you would something like, I don't know, think of your fall harness. You would not use your fall harness improperly. You wouldn't not cinch it up when you were climbing. You wouldn't make sure that it's connected properly. You certainly wouldn't climb if it was frayed. You certainly wouldn't climb if it had cuts on it and any other kind of disrepair. Both of them are life-saving pieces of equipment. Both of them have rely on the integrity in order to provide their job, and that's a life-saving piece of equipment. So think about it that way. So as we simplify this thing, arc-rated flame-resistant clothing appropriate to the hazard. If you have a five-calorie hazard, wear six to seven calories of protection. Always the outermost layer. Be cautious of things that can stick in and outside that layer. Be very cautious of that. It makes sure it's zipped up, buttoned up, etc. Natural non-melting undergarments at the very least, cotton, silk, or wool for colder climates, those are the only acceptable arc-rated FR base layers even better. So good, I just wear my shirt, I wear nothing underneath that's potentially meltable. Better, I wear 100% uh, natural fibers, which are cotton, wool, silk. Best, I go to two uh, flame-resistant layers. Clean, known, uh, control, uh, flammable contaminants on the job site, repair correctly, and remove from service uh, when needed. We always talk about the rules, and the rules are real simple. Always rolled, tucked, and buttoned. On the left there, you see an electrician that made one mistake. That mistake at literally existed for about a tenth of a second, and it 
virtually, well, it changed his, the course of his life. Uh, you can see up and around mid-bicep where he rolled up his arc-rated shirt. He also removed his rubbers and his leathers. This was a failure to verify. What he thought he turned off didn't. And when he took his screwdriver and removed all his PPE and went into that piece of equipment, it arced. That tenth of a second arc flash definitely uh, altered the course uh, of his career and potentially his life. Simple mistake. Uh, this sticker dons a hard hat in a utility to always remind their employees to button their shirts, tuck them in, and roll them down. The equipment is always energized. Their old policy was when they worked de-energized, they were allowed to be unbuttoned, rolled up, and untucked. Unfortunately, there was an incident. Uh, the corresponding arc flash ignited the cotton uh, company t-shirt underneath. The corresponding burn injuries resulted in a fatality. So as we wrap up here in the next couple slides, just a real quick bonus. Uh, if you all wear high-vis reflective vests or rain gear in and around what you're doing, a couple things to keep in mind. If your rain gear or vests are tested or claimed to be flame resistant based on just one standard, one standard, you probably have the wrong rain gear, the wrong vests. The proper standard for arc flash rain gear is 1891. The proper standard for arc rated vests is ASTM 1506. It will have an arc rating in it. You know you've got the right stuff. Be very, very cautious. Things to look for. If your rain gear claims to be flame resistant to ASTM 2302, that is the heat resistant, uh, flame resistant uh, standard, that standard has been withdrawn because it's been, frankly, abused within the marketplace to incorrectly communicate the properties of rain gear and vests to the wearer. Garments tested to that, you have no idea how they're going to perform in your hazard. Similar to 6413, 6413 is a vertical flame test. That is one of the baseline tests to demonstrate flame-resistant properties that we start with to do a bunch of other tests. In and of its loan, by itself, is not a performance standard. Again, you will have no idea how your rain gear or vests will perform in that hazard. 701, it's a standard for linens and draperies. Primarily in the hospitality industry, it's not a garment standard. If that's the only standard in your more than likely vest, not so much rain gear, but it's a few rain gear out there that are claiming FR to NFPA 701, it will not work. As standalones, there is no performance indication at all on that ring. You could be jeopardizing the investment. If you're making an investment of $800 to $1,000 in arc-rated clothing for your electricians, it can be dramatically jeopardized by putting in the wrong rain gear and the wrong vests. An example, we are seeing a lot of this uh, in the marketplace. Uh, ANSI 107-2015 thankfully has stepped up in the standard and told you what your high-vis, either rain gear or vests, need to be in order to be FR. They have to claim that they've been tested to one of these five standards. ASTM 1506, there's your electrical. ASTM 1891, there's your rain gear. Uh, 2733 is flash fire, 1977 is wild land, and 2112 is flash fire uh, also. If it's not FR, they have to tell you it's not FR. Here's a prime example. We have seen this labeling in and around high-vis safety apparel in probably the last 12 to 18 months. In this, it's claiming SE. SE is not a designation of anything when it comes to arc flashes and flash fires. All this is telling you is the outcome of a test, ASTM 6413, that this fabric self-extinguished. That is meaningless because it's not been exposed to an arc flash or a flash fire, so it does not tell you anything about how that high-vis gear will perform in your hazard. The others, as you read the fine print here, 
it states ANSI 107, it says it's non-FR. In here, it tells you it's non-FR. Down on the lower right, if you read that, it says Type R, Class 2, FR, ASTM 6413. So the line before it's not FR, in here it's FR. How can you say that it's FR in and of the same label when it's incorrect? The other scary thing is in this fine print here, you read self-extinguishing characteristics or properties here will wear out with washing. Well, is it washing? Is it rain? Is it getting it wet? Is it sitting in the back of my truck? What is it? Be very, very cautious of misleading labels. And my, why are they being misleading? I don't know. There is no reason to communicate the minimum flame-resistant properties in this particular uh, garment for anybody who's doing any electrical work. This maybe could be sold into light welding, light grinding, anything along those lines, but in no way should this be anywhere near an electric arc flash or flash fire. So with that, I think we have about five minutes. I'll, I'll hand it back over to Barry, and as Barry said, I'll echo that. If we don't get to what you asked today, they will send me all the questions Within the next five to seven days, I will get you an answer. If I can't answer, I will attempt to get you the resources to find your answer. With that, again, I want to thank you for spending time today, and hopefully everybody got a little nugget out of that. Great job, Derek. Thank you so much for your insights and your expertise today. Uh, before we start the q and I want to remind everyone of the evaluation survey we're asking you to complete. Uh, the survey should be appearing on your screen right now. Uh, your input is very important to us because it will help us improve our future webcasts. If you do not see the evaluation survey on your screen, please turn off your pop-up blocker. You may also access the survey by clicking on the survey button near the lower right portion of your screen. Now let's get to a couple questions here, Derek. You talked a great deal about uh, laundering and care of FR clothing. Uh, we've had several questions from folks about um, the life cycle of FR clothing. Uh, for example, should garments be discarded after X number of cycles, or, or can it be used indefinitely if the garment is not compromised? Great question. Uh, I'm going to do my best to answer this, obviously answering it two ways. One, as a representative of bulwark. All bulwark garments are guaranteed for the life of that garment, and by life of the garment, it means usable life. It's not thread-borne, it's, it's not worn, it's, it's not uh, compromised, it's not frayed. The FR properties are there forever. For the large majority of U.S.-based manufacturing utilizing U.S. fabrics, and that's where you have to do a little bit of your homework on what you're buying, that holds true across all uh, fabric compositions, across all technologies today. Great. We have a question about the chimney effect that you mentioned, and, and uh, Dorothy wants to know, are there any videos available on the chimney effect that can be used uh, as part of a training module for, for workers? Good question. Uh, we do, we do know what happens in the real world. Obviously, not every incident is caught on video. In some cases, we do know when we see that garments have been, uh, undergarments have been damaged and the outer layer has not, usually we can trace that back to how the garment was worn. Not as easy to replicate and catch on, on video each and every single time. Uh, as a whole, we know it happens. As a whole, from a logic standpoint, we know it happens. Uh, we are attempting ourselves in the next 12 to 18 months to try to replicate that uh, and see if we can get something on video because it's always asked for. Uh, it's just usually that to catch that incident where that's flaring up and not have the outer layer fa fail to where you can say, well, obviously the outer layer broke open at the chest and that's where the ignition was. It didn't come from underneath. There's tons of variables in order to do that. Just use a common sense approach. Hot air rises. If my arc comes out, hits the ground, mushrooms, and starts coming upwards, it's going to find the least path of resistance, and that's going to be my untucked garment. 
Great. Thank you, Derek. Unfortunately, we're running out of time today. I'm sorry we didn't get to everyone's questions, but uh, as Derek mentioned, all of today's unanswered questions will be forwarded on. Uh, once again, I hope you take some time to fill out the evaluation survey on your screen to give us your feedback today. Uh, that ends today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. I'd like to thank Derek Sang, everyone at Bulwark, and all of you who listened in today. Have a safe day, everyone.